our God's an amazing God. And I know you know that, but let me explain why I'm saying it. Uh, last year, around July, uh, me and the other pastors of our Divine Savior churches in Texas and, and Florida got together and we planned out the sermon series for the next year. And one of the series that we planned was There's Another in the Fire. And we planned it to start right after Easter and end today. And the reason that we, we wanted to do the series is because uh, what Daniel and his friends went through uh, is kind of what we're going through today. At least Christians can relate to it. Daniel and his friends, they, they lived in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon came over, king of Babylon, came over and took over Jerusalem around 600 B.C. and deported some of those Jewish people over to Babylon. And so they get ripped up out of their own culture, out of their own home, out of their comfortability, and they get moved over to Babylon where now they're getting pressure to give up their faith in God. They're getting pressured to uh, be indoctrinated with the culture around them. Uh, there's evil. There's oppression. And how do you live in a place like that? You and I are Christians, and our home is in heaven, and here we are living in a world that's not our home. And so uh, how do we live when there's oppression? How do we live uh, when our culture is trying to indoctrinate us and pull us away from God? How do we live when there's pressure to give up our faith in the true God? And so we've been looking at this for, for seven weeks now. This is the eighth. And here's how our God's so amazing. Here's how we see that he's in control. We've had this series planned for an entire year. And today's theme is there's another in the fire when we need hope in our hopelessness. And given the current events of our world today, I can't think of a better title for today's sermon. And so we're going to look where hope comes from in our hopelessness. And to do so, we're going to look at the second half of Daniel chapter 7. Last week, we looked at the first half of Daniel chapter 7. And if you were with us, you know that we Daniel had this vision. Uh, no, not like a vision for a business. He had a vision, a dream that God gave him. And, and what he saw was four beasts that came out of the sea. And these beasts were terrifying. Uh, they each got worse and worse and worse as they oppressed people, as they conquered people. Uh, one beast he saw was actually eating human flesh. It was terrifying. And yet we saw that God is in control. When these beasts, who turn out to be four kings, when they seem like they have control over everything, they actually don't. God has everything under control. Today we're going to look at the second half of Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to look at the interpretation of this dream. And so we're in Daniel chapter 7, uh, we're beginning with verse 15, and here is what we're told. I, Daniel was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. So Daniel saw these visions, and he was completely disturbed. He was troubled in his spirit. Why? Well, as we just said, what did he see? He saw these beasts that are absolutely terrifying. And it's almost like he was watching a scary movie. You know when you watch a scary movie and, and then you go to bed at night and you close your eyes and you, you see the scary images from the movie replaying in your mind? It's almost like that's happening with Daniel. And it's, he's, he's disturbed and troubled. His eyes are open, yet the image of the vision won't go away. He closes his eyes and the image of the vision dances through his mind. He can't get this out of his mind and it's disturbing and it's troubling. I think we can understand that a little bit. We know what it's like to see a vision, an image, and we can't get that out of our heads to the point that it's disturbing and troubling. Maybe for you parents, uh, you're disturbed and troubled as you think about your kid's future. You, you try not to imagine the future. You try not to think about it. 
but what is life going to be like for your kids in 15 years? And again, you, you try to scrub the images out of your mind that you've conjured up. You, you try not to think about it, but the images, you just can't get them out of your head. It's terrifying. It's troubling. Maybe for some of you, you can't get that image out of your head that you saw on the news. 30 million unemployed. And then you saw that the, the news uh, the pictures on the news of the long lines out of food banks. What's going to happen with you? Are you going to lose your job? What about the people that work under you that you care about? It's troubling. It's disturbing. Maybe for some of you, you can't stop seeing the image or the vision of a loved one who is sick has cancer, and you see that image of them over and over again, and it's troubling. Maybe the image you can't get out of your mind right now is of a cop kneeling on the neck of George Floyd until he dies. Maybe the vision that you have in your mind that uh, is troubling you is the image that you saw in the news of rioters, looters, people setting cities on fire, people beating business owners who are trying to block people from getting to their business. We see the images of the visions of hatred, sickness, disease. We see the hatred, the evil through this world. And then we see the the vision, the image of the decreasing number of Christians in the world, and it seems pretty hopeless. Where does all this come from? It comes from the evil in the world, right? And where's the evil? Sin and the devil. It's the same thing that that propelled these four kings that Daniel saw into power. It's the same evil that led them to feast on flesh, to destroy, to conquer, to oppress people. It's the same devil, the same sinful evil that runs through the course of history, that runs through everybody, manifesting itself. You see the evil in the world And it's the work of Satan and sin uh, going through people. And it seems pretty hopeless at times, doesn't it? As Daniel is troubled in his spirit, as Daniel is disturbed, and he's thinking about this vision, he wants to know what it all means. And, and And in his dream, an angel happens to be standing there. And so he asks the angel, What is all this about? Here's what the angel told him. Daniel says, I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Ever. Think of how hopeless this situation was for Daniel. Uh, Daniel at this time was about 70, 80 years old, and uh, he's living in Babylon. And if he had any hope whatsoever of going back to Jerusalem, this vision pretty much cleared it up you're not. If he had any hope to live in a kingdom where he wasn't oppressed, this vision pretty much said, not going to happen. In fact, there's four kings coming, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So pretty much, Daniel, you're going to live out the rest of your life in a pretty brutal situation. But, there was a really important but, the angel said. But despite all this, The holy people of the Most High will possess the kingdom of God forever. You see, the hope that Daniel had was to keep one eye up toward heaven. 
Yes, we need to live in, in, in this world, but keep one eye up to heaven all the time because there's your hope. Life can seem like there, it's all hopelessness. It can feel like there's void of any light at the end of the tunnel. And yet there's always hope for the Christian because in the end we know how all this ends. Evil, hatred, all of this ends. And we possess the kingdom of God forever. And so no matter how bad things get here, we always have hope. Hope in the kingdom of God. That we possess it. It kind of reminds me of a story that I heard of a, a dad who got to his kid's Little League game late because he was, uh, got off work late. And so the dad comes up and he sees that his son's playing right field. And so he walks down the fence to his son and he says, uh, Hey, what's the score? And his son yells back, 18 nothing. We're down. And his dad said, Oh man, I'm sorry. You, you must be really disappointed. And the kid looks over and he says, Disappointed? We haven't even had a chance to bat yet. This kid, he's on a team down 18 nothing in the top of the first. His offense still hadn't had a chance to come up. And, and so he's not disappointed. Why? Because he has hope that his offense is going to come back. And that they're going to win. As a Christian, sometimes we feel like we're down 18 nothing, And that it's a hopeless situation. But for you and me, we always have hope. Because we know how the game's going to end. God's kingdom is going to come. Our offense is going to come and end the game. And it ends with us winning. We have hope. We could be down a million to nothing. And we still have hope. God's kingdom has come uh, already as we spread the word of God and we spread the message of Jesus. God's word is on the move. But the ultimate coming is at the end when his kingdom comes and he ends it all. And you and I possess the kingdom forever. That's our hope. But is that where you find your hope? Where are you putting your hope today? Is it in the, the hope that there's a, a cure for cancer, a cure for COVID, a vaccine? Is it the hope that uh, science progresses to where pretty much any sickness and disease goes away so that we can live for who knows how long? Is your hope in a job change, uh, a career change? Is your hope that your problems will go away if you just have a change of scenery? Is your hope in leadership change? Is your hope that your problems will go away if your boss leaves and you get a new boss or if uh, the president changes or the leaders in the country change? Is your hope that you'll go to school with your friends in the fall? Some of that will bring about hope. Some of that will end some of our problems, but I promise you more problems will come up eventually if we find our hope there. Eventually we'll end up disappointed because those things can't take away the root problem and it's sin and it's evil and it's the devil. On this earth we will continue to have problems after problems after problems. And our hope is in heaven. Hope is a strange thing, isn't it? Because hope gives you confidence in, in the bleakest of times. But your hope ultimately rests on the object, object in which you've placed your hope in. And so if your object that you've placed your hope in disappoints and, and doesn't come through, then you're defeated. And if our hope is in something man-made, we're ultimately eventually going to be disappointed. But for you and me as Christians, our hope is in the kingdom of God. Our hope is that heaven is ours and that we will live there forever. And to give you a little bit more hope, I want to read you what this looks like. It's from Revelation chapter 7, where the Apostle John, he sees a vision of heaven. And here's what he sees. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. 
And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. What a great uh, description of earth, right? The great tribulation uh, where there's just heartache and suffering and pain. That's here. These are those who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Where's the hope for you and me? It's there. It's in that kingdom. It's in the kingdom of God that we will possess forever. And what's the kingdom of God like? No sadness, no sorrows, no injustices, no oppression, nothing that can ever harm us. Sin and evil don't live there. They've been conquered. There in the kingdom of God, no matter what is causing you to feel hopeless, no matter what is causing you to cry, it will be taken away because sin is gone forever. And Jesus himself will wipe your tears away. That is hope. And it's all yours. You possess it, not because you're better than other people, not because you have it more together than everyone else, not because you're morally right, but because the Lamb of God shed His blood and has washed you of all your sin. He has washed you of your evil talk. He has washed you of your evil actions. He has washed you of your hatred, your bitterness, your impatience, your worry, your fear. He has washed you clean of all sin. And He has given you this kingdom as a gift. And it's coming. This is the hope that we have. We as Christians, we're down 18 nothing at times. We still have hope because our kingdom is coming. God's kingdom is coming and we will live forever in heaven. And so while we're here on earth, we do keep one eye uh, looking around. We do live in the world, but we also have one eye on heaven. Looking forward to that day when we're with Jesus. But there's something else from this uh, section of Scripture that we find hope in, and it comes at the end of this vision or interpretation. Daniel asks this angel the interpretation of these things. And right after this, right after what we've read, Daniel says, I want more information on beast number four and the horn that's coming from him. And so the angel tells him, Beast number four is going to come out and is going to walk across the earth and, and completely destroy everything and conquer it. And then out of that, most, by the way, that beast was most, most likely Rome. Out of that comes a horn uh, that will speak blasphemy against God and oppress God's holy people. But here's what the angel says at the end of that in verse 26 and 27. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey Him. Did you catch that? Who will be given the power, the sovereignty, and the greatness? It will all be handed over to the holy people of the Most High, to you and me. You know, a lot of times, uh, I think we can get the picture that heaven is going to be, uh, that we're just going to be happy to be in heaven type of thing. Like, oh, how did we sneak by and, and we're in the corner and everybody knows we really shouldn't be there, but somehow we snuck in and we're very thankful to be there, but uh, I don't really belong. That's not the case at all. For Christians, we have been adopted into God's family. When, when Jesus died for us and washed our sins away, when the Holy Spirit worked faith in our heart that Jesus is our Savior, God adopted us into His family. And what does that mean? 
it means we're from a, a royal family. We're from the royalty of God, and we will reign with Him. Paul says as much in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, if we endure to the end, if we endure, we hold on to the faith to the end, we will reign with Christ. Jesus says the same thing in, in Luke chapter 22, verse 30. He's talking to his disciples, and he says that God has conferred on him the kingdom, and so he is conferring on his disciples the kingdom, so that they may eat and drink in the kingdom and sit on thrones. Do you want hope in a hopeless situation? It's knowing that one day we are going to sit next to Jesus as he judges the nations, as he judges all the evil, all the oppression, all the hatred, as he judges every evil that is in this world, we will be sitting next to him because we are part of the royal family. Because Jesus lived, died, and rose for us. Because we have faith in Jesus as our Savior, we have this gift of being from the royal family. What would our lives look like if we lived knowing this every day? If we consciously thought about this, that, that one day all of this evil is going to end and we're going to live forever and ever in the kingdom of God. But not just live there, but we're going to rule with Jesus because we're from the royal family. Imagine what that would look like. As uh, situations seem hopeless, all of a sudden, our lives wouldn't be controlled by fear, but we'd have confidence. Instead of being bitter, we'd be forgiving. Instead of being filled with hate, we'd be filled with love. Instead of despairing, we'd have hope. Why? Because no matter if we're down 18 and nothing, we're going to win. And we're going to win because God's kingdom is ours forever, all given to us through Jesus. So as you face hopeless situations, uh, always have one eye up to heaven. Remember that the kingdom is yours. You possess it. And there there's no crying, no pain, no suffering. Evil will be gone. And we look forward to that day. And then remember your identity. You're a blood-bought child of God. You've been adopted into his family and you're part royalty. You are royal in God's sight because you belong to the royal family. And so everything that happens here will be answered to. And Jesus will get the end, uh, the end laugh. And we will be right by his side. And so until then, have hope. Even in hopeless situations. Because that's what we have as Christians. Today's the last day in the book of Daniel. And uh, it's not the end of Daniel. There's a couple more chapters. But the reason we're not uh, doing those is because there's different, uh, there's different stories, there's different visions, there's some different information. But overall, each vision from here to the end has the same overall message. God's people will suffer for a little while. There will be oppression. But in the end, God wins. And so I want to close us in this series uh, with Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, because here we have one of the greatest uh, depictions of the resurrection in the Old Testament. Uh, here's what Daniel says. First, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We have that light of hope in our lives because we know how the story ends. And so let's shine like stars. Let's shine with the brightness of heaven that is in us because we know where we're going. We know what the kingdom of God is all about. We know Jesus. So let's shine in a world that needs hope. God be with you today and this week as you shine to others who maybe feel like they're in a hopeless situation. May you shine in their lives and bring them hope. 
We're going to close our service today with prayer. Uh, we've got uh, a special prayer. We're going to pray for Gary and Linda, who are celebrating 50 years of marriage. So we're going to pray for them. And then, of course, we're going to pray for our country. And so we're going to pray, and we're going to close our prayers with the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you that you have adopted us into your family. We thank you for Jesus who shed his blood to wash our sins away. Uh, we thank you that we're, we're spotless in your sight, and one day we will possess the kingdom forever and ever. We thank you that uh, you have adopted us into the royal family, and now you have sent us out with power to change people's lives, uh, not with force, uh, but with the force of your word. As we spread the message of Jesus to more and more people, uh, we give hope to more and more people. Continue to build us up. Let Jesus, the King of Kings, rule our hearts. And let us always have hope, no matter what the situation is. Thank you for Christian friends who uh, continue to encourage us and remind us of the hope that we have. And to help us to keep one eye up towards heaven, where one day we will live with you. We thank you for our Christian friends, Gary and Linda, uh, who are celebrating 50 years of marriage. Marriage is a blessing, and we thank you that uh, they've had 50 years together. We thank you for all of the blessings, all of the grace that you have showed them through the 50 years, and we ask you to continue to bless their marriage as they go forward. Let their love for each other continue to grow as they continue to grow in your love. And of course, Lord, today we pray for our nation. We pray for all of the oppression, all of the hatred. We pray uh, for the injustices. We pray for uh, change, but not just change in programs and things like that. We ask for change in people's hearts. Uh, real change begins with knowing your love and the love that you have for us, that you forgive us, that you love us, that you've adopted us into your family. Let your love fill more and more people's hearts. Let us be the light that people see uh, to bring them to you. Help us to not cause division, but instead fix division and bring unity uh, through your word, through your truth, through your love. Let us be beacons of light in this hopeless situation. Be with our leaders. Give them humility. Give them love. Give them guidance. And continue to be with everyone during this time. Bring unity uh, and drive out the evil one. The devil is loving this, and we ask that you uh, cast him away, that you get rid of him and all of his influence uh, so that we may have unity uh, and love. We ask you to be with us all during this time. We ask you to be with our families. Continue to watch over them. Be with us wherever we go. Protect, guide us, lead us, and bless us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. It's in his name that we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.